Welcome back, everybody, to the Club Metaverse podcast. Uh, unfortunately, in today's guest, Rizwan Riz Verk, um, I had a little technical hiccup, so I lost about the first five, ten minutes of the conversation, but we picked it up in a nice spot. Uh, today, uh, we are talking uh, to Riz Verk, successful entrepreneur, venture capitalist, video game pioneer, best-selling author, and indie film producer, Riz uh, founded uh, the Play Labs at MIT um, and Bayview Labs, a Silicon Valley investment fund. Um, and he is a mentor advisor at 500 uh, startups. Um, he's with uh, Griffin Gaming Partners, Ridge Ventures, the list goes on and on. And um, I think uh, we had quite the fascinating conversation about uh, defining uh, key elements of what the metaverse is and can be. And without further ado, we pick up the conversation midstream. Apologies for that, but hope that you enjoy. Thank you. And and a virtual economy, you know, which are things two things that tie into the blockchain, Web three, crypto world as well. Uh, in terms of, you know, I see NFTs as as kind of the the back door to uh, cross portable objects across the metaverse. And I have a feeling you do too, based upon some of the discussions we've had, Yeah, um, you know, and, um, uh, and, and so, and, and obviously, you know, you need to have um, an exchange rate between virtual currency and fiat currencies and, you know, Bitcoin wasn't around in the days of, of, of second life or metaverse 1.0. So you had gold and, but Linden Labs was one of the first that actually had a exchange rate between their virtual currency, Linden dollars and U.S. dollars. Uh, mm. And I remember doing a research project on it when I was in business school at Stanford almost a decade ago. Uh, but yeah, so so today I would describe it as a set of interconnected virtual worlds uh, that, you know, where you have a virtual identity, usually based upon a 3D avatar, and you have a virtual objects and possessions, and you can wander around different virtual landscapes, whether you're in a VR headset or not. Yeah, and how do you see, because one thing that I've, um, so, so first of all, um, you know, Snow Crash, is one of my, you know, favorite books. I, I've, I've had the pleasure of, of speaking with Mr. Stevenson several times. Back in the old days, uh, Neil Stevenson and I were actually uh, at one point building an ARG together. I don't know if you remember, but back maybe this is like 10, 15 years ago, there was a, a, a trend in kind of gaming called alternative reality games. I don't know ah, if you remember that. I do remember uh, hearing about that. Yeah. 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 It was like a short lived trend. Yeah. And uh, Neil Stevenson and I were in talks early on to create a snow crash based ARG. But in any case, with the 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 thing about um, snow crash versus ready player one is that in snow crash, it's definitely a little bit more of a dystopian, uh, you know, future that the protagonist, hero protagonist, is actually using all of his skills and his powers to 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 break down, right? And that carries a little bit into Ready Player One as well. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I've never read the book. I've only seen the movie. I've seen the movie like seven times. I actually love that movie. I think the movie's great. <laughs> Um, but even in that movie, like the moral of the story is that the meta, you know, that uh, the Oasis shouldn't be open seven days a week. It should only be open five days a week. Right. Like that was kind of like their big victory after figuring out the whole Willy Wonka, you know, uh, adventure that they go on. Um, do you see like how, how do you I guess my question is, is how do we avoid this kind of oppressive dystopian painting that neil stevenson was portraying in the metaverse because the metaverse that he created was a necessity out of the fact that the population on the planet had gotten so big that people couldn't really uh, uh, like afford to interact physically anymore uh, that the only place to actually have a little bit of space was inside of this digital reality what 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 are some of the philosophies that we need to keep in mind to avoid this whole metaverse thing from getting too dystopian 
Yeah, well, I think, you know, in both Snow Crash and Ready Player One, and, you know, I had to go back and reread both of those because it had been many years since I, I read the original novels recently yeah. while I was sort of doing an analysis. And by the way, it's the 30-year anniversary of Snow Crash, and so I was just... Oh, wow, this year. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah this yeah, year, yeah. 2022, yeah. that's right. Yeah, so I was just on uh, another podcast talking about that. And, you know, the dystopian element is definitely there in both of those versions, and it's almost like it drove people into wanting to spend most of their lives in the virtual reality. And even in Ready Player One, they may have played this down in the movie, but certainly in the book, you know, it's pretty clear that it's a dystopian world, that environmental damage has been done. I mean, there's still a functioning government, but for the most part, things have, you know, kind of collapsed. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're living in the, in the midst of an economic collapse. It's a little bit different from the Snow Crash dystopia, where you have these different enclaves of warring factions, sure. you know, all with in the same, you know, Los Angeles metro area, different parts of the world, and pretty much law and order has kind of broken down. Um, and, and the metaverse is one of the ways that, you know, everybody <laughs> communicates and interacts yeah. with one another. But, you know, within, within the social study, social science study of science and technology, you know, there's, there's an idea that most technologies have unintended consequences, right? Mm. Um, and because they're unintended, we can't necessarily predict what they are. But oftentimes, you know, technologies will end up doing not what the creators say they, they, they should do, which is, you know, I'm putting this out to democratize uh, access to information or, uh, you know, technology to democratize society. And oftentimes they end up uh, they will end up, you know, accentuating some of the inequalities that already exist. So, mm. you know, even in Snow Crash, if you look at it, you know, it was considered that the 60 million most valuable people on the planet were the ones who could afford the computers to right. get into the metaverse and everybody else couldn't. So it was like this kind of place you wanted to be in many ways, right? It was kind of, I mean, not sort of an exclusive club. Obviously within Snow Crash, you had an actual club, exclusive club called the Black Sun that right. everyone wanted to be a part of, but the metaverse itself. And part of the reason why the entrepreneurs who got in the metaverse did, did well was because, uh, you know, it, 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 it had so many eyeballs and, you know, there were a lot of things that, that he predicted that have come true beyond the virtual reality side. You know, I mean, he had this idea of exchanging virtual currency with each other near the right. end. There's a meeting with the mafia leaders right. and the leaders Uncle of these Enzo. Other enclaves, Uncle Enzo, that's right. And yeah. the other enclaves <laughs> all in virtual reality. And, you know, he hands them a little hypercard, he called it. Right. And, and the hypercard had say 25 million us dollars and, Boom, they were transferred into his account. Right, right. right. Spoiler part. warning for the people that are out there wanting to read the book, but I mean, it's been 20, it's been 30 years. So. It's been 30 years by now. Yeah. If you haven't read it, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Plus, you know, that's not that big of a spoiler, but uh, <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I... But, but, you know, if you look at social media and, and, and what some of the drawbacks have, have, you know, become of that, I think, you know, we can be at least, uh, we can be uh, um, sensitive to, you know, what those types of things might be. I mean, it turns out part of it is the algorithms that are driving people into kind of more and more of a tribal uh, environment where, you know, mm -hmm. you only see the content that you agree with, generally speaking. Um, and, you know, so depending on where you stand on that, that that is a dystopic element already that's come into play with our online lives. So I think we can look at, you know, how the internet has evolved uh, and it's resulted in a few big players Sure, uh, who yeah. also have a lot of the power uh, right. and then they define the algorithms and the algorithms are kind of controlling what we see. Uh, and then there's other unintended social consequences, you know, around identity and comparing yourself to others and, you know, rates of depression among teenagers who grew up with social media. So you know, I think there's a lot of those types of things that we can play, you know, we can look at and, and try to see about, you know, while we're constructing uh, this new imaginary of the metaverse or or the metaverse multiverse, as I call it, because there are so many different versions and flavors out there. Mm. You know, we can look to some of that. We can also look at the issue of identity. You know, um, if if somebody has an avatar that looks like them versus an avatar that doesn't. Right. Uh, that's an interesting question. Like, you know, you've got a it looks like one of the uh, the bored ape uh, uh, avatars there. Right. And so, yeah. you know, we have anthropomorphic avatars, which are avatars that look human. And then we have what I like to call identomorphic avatars, which are mm. avatars that look like you in the real world. And so I often like to ask this question of students, you know, who spend a lot of time as avatars in games already. 
uh, you know, about, well, you know, do you want an identomorphic avatar or not? And, you know, the general conclusion is, well, if you're at work, you want one that looks like you, but if you're out socializing, you may want a different one. Right, uh, right. And, and so, but that brings up all kinds of issues, you know, around race and identity and discrimination and, you know, do you perhaps want to disguise yourself as somebody else and see how other people react? I mean, it's actually an interesting way uh, to to see how other people react is to take on an avatar, even in just the old MMORPGs, you know, if you had a male avatar versus a female avatar, you would start to experience things, you know, pretty differently from the other players in the social environment. So all, all technology is social in its way, and, mm -hmm. and there are implications of that. Those are some things we can start to think through earlier. Yeah, the the um, the concept of um, the sort of avatar and snow crash is probably the thing that has stuck with me uh, the longest when I started reading that book, um, because the the idea that you can be at the Black Sun or be anywhere in the metaverse and look around, and because of the fidelity and the quality of the avatars that you see around you, you can immediately make pretty accurate assumptions about who that person is, right? Which is right. Um, kind of a lot more extreme even than in the real world. I mean, you can see somebody who looks down on his luck, maybe not wearing great clothes, and you can see somebody dressed, you know, with very expensive clothes. You can make certain assumptions with that as well. But in the in the metaverse that Neil Stevenson painted, you could see avatars that were technically very low grade and avatars that were technically very high grade. And the high grade avatars are the ones that you knew you had to A, worry more about because they can kill you and, and end your avatar existence. Um, but then, you know, Neil Stevenson, obviously being the brilliant writer that he is, has a a black and white avatar as he called it uh because in the metaverse to your point if you didn't have the computer to be able to log into the metaverse you can log in through a payphone and right. uh, the metaverse uh, and the avatars that would come through the payphone were these black and white flat two-dimensional facsimiles of the person on the phone and this is kind of a spoiler warning um the that's how the virus the snow crash virus starts spreading throughout the metaverse is because one of these black and white avatars is doing all of the you know all the bad stuff um and with with the current metaverse i you know like i agree with you because even in my own project you know the idea of being able to play the game as an ape versus being able to play the game as a lesser known sort of pfp nft or even one of my own uh, avatar you know right. Like NFTs will give you an immediate understanding like, oh, if if I buy into the concept that he's connected his wallet and now that ape is showing up in the metaverse, that ape, I know the floor on that ape is somewhere around 100 Ether. So, you know, that's a $300,000 avatar running around versus one that might be at like 0 0.01 ETH. And, you know, so it's like, oh, you're a poor guy. You're a rich guy. Right. So, right. So, yeah. So, you know, yeah. God, you know, now that I say that out loud, it doesn't sound all that inclusive, right? It sounds <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that that is very much, you know, one of those types of socioeconomic factors that gets reflected in the technology. And and this was present even in Snow Crash. I mean, you mentioned the black and white versus the high grade avatars, but even within the, 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 the 3D avatars, there were like these generic, you know, they called them brandies and clints, right? Yeah, They're kind of yeah. like the avatars you get when you log in. Uh, right. And then you can get the avatar creator kit, right, where you could customize it. And so you get into this this issue where, you know, the in fact, you know, today you've got, you know, so many different uh, you know accessories being sold within virtual worlds already. Sure, yeah. I mean, that's the you know, whole Fortnite within business model. Skins, Fortnite, Roblox, even without the NFT, you know, uh, standard being behind it. But you add, you know, the NFT sneakers and, you know, as, as we get more and more portable objects. And I really believe... You know, that is the future of, of these objects is to link the NFT with 3D models that can be pulled into um, and be interoperable with any of the metaverses that you might want to visit. So you what, get Crystal, to carry 1000% and that that is the sort of number one guiding principle of my project is to make sure that those seeds 
uh, that hopefully eventually will lead to a truly kind of open, decentralized system that allows um, the, the owners of those avatars to have complete sovereignty over those assets, you know, because I, look, I'm a huge gamer, I'm, you know, probably too much of a gamer. And, um, you know, like I said, um, I used to be a huge Star Wars Galaxies player, obviously a big World of Warcraft player, but I've also been a professional my whole life, an entrepreneur. I've worked at, you know, big companies as an employee. So I've also been a very busy person. So for me, it's, it's been, it was always very difficult to grind out characters, right? To level out from level one to 60, because that could take months, you know, to actually <laughs> right. do that. And that's like six, seven hours a day. And it'll still take you a month, two months to level out a character. So I was one of those people that bought characters on eBay, you know, and um, and that's not allowed, right? Like, you know, that's a direct violation of the, you know, right. of the EULA. And I've had accounts completely banned because of that, you know, where what one one thing that I do like about the concept of the NFT thing, and the reason I can even use this ape in this podcast is that it's it's a digital asset that you own all of the intellectual property rights to. You know, I'm right. not able to say that this is a board ape podcast, but I'm able to use my ape as a kind of a symbol that this is a paradigm shift. You know, that like what what I bring into this world, I can freely do what I want with it. I have ownership over it. I can sell it. I can trade it. I can delete it. I can do whatever I kind of want with it um, without having to worry about some larger group you know, managing uh, the rights to it and like potentially, you know, suing me or whatever. Uh, and, and that to me is an interesting, you know, like evolution of this whole game space, because even in even in a lot of these NFT projects that you see out there uh, in terms of the game ones, uh, the concept of interoperability is not really one that's um, really like I think um, – um, sort of driven home. I mean, even you mentioned Decentraland. There's another big one called Sandbox. These are really cool games, but you really can't bring anything in there from the outside. You can only, um, you know, leverage their tool set. And if you buy quote unquote real estate in both of these games, you're pretty much limited to coding that real estate with their proprietary editor that makes everything kind of look the same. You know, and that to me is antithetical to the whole concept that we're trying to build of a truly kind of interoperable virtual reality um, where, you know, it has value. I, actually, I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but I actually think the closest thing to a metaverse that we have today, you know, forget all the, you know, central control is something like YouTube. You know, YouTube really created this idea of, a network of television stations that's just completely all over the place, you know, and uh, one will direct you to another one and to another one and to another one. And they're all kind of interconnected based on tastes and flavors and, and, and whatever the algorithm says. But ultimately, it's a platform for people to leverage their own ideas in a way that can um, bring them some kind of upside, you know, and and they have skin in the game. You know, like I think that that's maybe a simpler way of saying all that crap I just said is that the metaverse, you got to have you got to build enough tools to give the user skin in the game. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you there. I mean, in the sense that this idea of digital ownership, I think, just like this idea that we've been talking about digital identity. So I have this framework that I'm doing as part of my Ph.D. work, which is uh, the threads of the metaverse and, and, and these threads you know, can be used to compare different metaverses, fictional ones, as well as real ones. Uh, but they also kind of bring up these core issues, like identity is a core issue, mm -hmm. and avatars and what they look like, and who owns the avatars, and can you move them around. And another is digital objects, you know, how portable right. are these objects? I mean, the objects represent artifacts in a way that have been created with some amount of work, but they also have a lot of assumptions behind those. And, and, and I do think that, you know, most NFTs today, I mean, I, I was uh, 
looking at a, at a guy who had bought an NFT and then he had to create a 3D model and he had to import it into Blender and he had to do something else. And sure. I mean, he had to go through like 15 steps, right, to actually use that in, in, in any coherent way other than just to show. Right. Same you thing know. I did, right? Like I built this 3D model of a two-dimensional JPEG. So, yeah, same, same, same basic concept. Yeah. So you had to go through all of that, you know, but I, I do believe that that's becoming, uh, you know, they're becoming more sophisticated. Uh, for example, I, I, I was looking at uh, an AI avatar uh, term that I like to shorten and call AVIs, you mm. know, which are, um, you know, some of these virtual characters that also have AI behind them. So they they're don't have a person behind them acting like virtual influencers typically do. Uh, and there's one called kuki.ai, K-U-K-I. And uh, she was built originally as a chatbot, and then they added a default avatar that looks like, you know, a young Asian woman because that's the personality that uh, right. that, that they have for Kuki. And, and actually, the chatbot that it was based on was one of the inspirations for the guy who made the movie Her. I don't know if you've oh, seen okay. that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Is it uh, Alice Bot? Was it kind of based I, on a... I'm forgetting the name of the bot, but it was by a company called Pandora Bots. Okay. Uh, and now they've spun out, you know, Kuki and, and other AI avatar-based uh you know, digital humans uh, as a separate, uh, what they're calling metabots, but they had this NFT drop and each NFT represented not just a different JPEG of that avatar, but an actual 3D model of an avatar that was generated using Epic's meta humans. Uh, so, you know, I got one of those NFTs and so I was, I'm able to talk to Kuki and her, the avatar she uses is the, is the one that was in the NFT that I bought, right? So now you have this linking of the NFT to an actual app to an actual 3D avatar. Now I can't quite use it in a bunch of different places yet. I can only use it on their site, but you can sure. see the idea between that and others who've done you know AI based NFTs or or other uh, kind of pieces of the the NFT that give you access, whether it's in the real world or in the metaverse. But if you look back at the history uh, of this, you know, you talked about uh, getting banned from video game companies mm -hmm. and, you know, that used to happen because of their terms of service. Now, one of the things that, that Second Life did, you know, back in the 2000s was they said, well, if you create content, then you are the owner of that content. Right. And so, you know, now we're seeing that on a broader scale with NFTs, but I felt like that was an important first step. Uh, in, in, in giving people ownership of, of digital assets and treating it like real property. And of course, mm. with cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, you know, now it's not just considered real property, you know, you're going to be taxed on it by the right. IRS, of course. We just had tax day, you know, a few right. days ago. If you liquidate, you know, we right? If you liquidate, I think if you that liquidate that's... Or even yeah. transfer to another crypto. Right, right, right. That's right. where if it you move problematic. It. If you do anything other than stare at the number that it's supposedly worth, you're going to get taxed. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And so it, it, it's it's pretty tricky to start doing, you know, any kind of real transactions with it because of, of all these implications that, that, that happen. So most people are just, you know, holding on or they do a straight buy and sell. And, and, and you know, some people are doing trading and that gets pretty complicated. But of course, now we at least have a framework for right. digital ownership. Right. And I think that's kind of the important point there is to have a distributed way for people to agree on, on who owns what. And once you've got that, as long as, you know, I, I remember uh, talking to some of the guys who worked on the, the ERC-721 standard, right, which was one of the first NFT sure. standards for um, the, the Ethereum blockchain and saying, well, there, at that point, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a required field for even an image, right? So it right. really was just a record. This person owns this number and that's it. Uh, they had an optional field where you could put something, but usually the images are stored off chain, right? Uh, in most cases, not always. I, I think now there's a lot more innovation going on with different chains. But I think the closer you link the actual visual representation of the object to the ownership, the closer we get to, I think, like the vision of the metaverse that you just described and that many, many people have, which is more of a decentralized metaverse where individuals own their own pieces of it. You know? Yeah. And, and that was actually my next kind of question was how do you, because, you know, you mentioned something about um, the current kind of internet. And I think metaverse is just essentially when people talk about the next internet, right? Like it's like the metaverse is the next internet. And, you know, there's this assumption that the metaverse will have some kind of, you know, machine human interface 
that's like, you know, a goggle or, you know, whether it's like a pair of glasses or some combination of AR, VR. But then you have Elon Musk saying correctly so, like, you know, AR, VR is going to have a very short lifespan because Neuralink is going to get in there and you're going to and you're not going to need to put something over your eyes because we can tap right into your brain, um, which is kind of a scary thought because I kind of want there to be like a 20, 30 year span of VR, AR technology. But, you know, he's right that it could be complete. We, we can skip that step and go straight into feed it into my brain. And there, then I'll start believing that maybe we do live already in a simulation because at that point you won't even know, right? Like, like did somebody hack into my neural link and they turned it on and I think I'm sleeping, but I'm actually awake. Uh, hacking with neural link is going to take on a whole other level. But anyway, before I, I, I go to the next talk in 10 years, um, how, how, how do you see yeah. the, the current, kind of metaverse evolving is it still going to be a flat screen experience or are you pretty sold that it will have predominantly a kind of ar vr form factor to it well i think there's the near term and then there's the long term right and i think you know in the near term i think it will have both um a uh, flat screen and more of a 3d vr ar flavor to it i mean i you know one of uh one of the professors um you know, who works uh, with science fiction asked me, well, what's different now? Why is the metaverse suddenly <laughs> becoming so popular now, right? And and there's this um, there's this concept that was articulated by um, sci-fi writer Cory Doctorow and others about the adjacent possible, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea was, you know, Leonardo da Vinci might have had the idea for a helicopter, but we didn't have all of the adjacent technologies that are necessary to really sure. make it work, uh, including the metals and, 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 you know, being able to the metallurgy and putting together, you know, objects uh, that, that could fly. And, and the same is true with uh, the metaverse and, you know, going back to second life, you know, Philip Rosedale again said that he, it was only when two things happened that he was able to go and create this because he'd been thinking about it since 92. And he said, one was, uh, broadband access, right? So people didn't necessarily have broadband access until really the late 90s, early 2000s, right? That's when pretty much, at least within major cities in the US. Uh, right. And then the second thing was graphics cards. So in order to have a real-time updating of graphics is you have to have kind of both of those things along with a bunch of other things as well. But those are adjacent technologies that made these 3D MMORPGs more possible than they were before. Uh, you know, it was pretty hard with those dial-up, right? Yeah, you know, I think we both remember the dial-up. <laughs> oh, one dial, yeah, yeah, yeah. Days of the internet where you had, you know, like a lot of- Oh, I played my MUDs on it, but then, but those were all text-based, so it was okay. Right, so that was okay, right? <laughs> but yeah. imagine doing that with, you know, uh, with World of Warcraft. I mean, that, that would be pretty difficult uh, to keep things updated. And so with, with the metaverse in the short term, you know, we're looking at just, just within the last few years, the, the VR headsets that are wireless, right? I mean, right. so I started to think about this question of the far future uh, of, of where the technology is going when I was playing a, a ping pong game in virtual reality using the HTC Vive back in 2016. And so this was, you know, six years ago now. And right. there was a wire connecting it, you know, up, went up and then connected it back to the computer. But yet it felt so realistic that for a moment I forgot that I was in virtual reality and I tried to put the paddle down on the table and I tried to lean against the table. And of right. course, you know, this was pretty primitive looking game too. It wasn't, you know, like a, like a fully realistic version, but the responsiveness was the thing that fooled my brain <laughs> into right. thinking uh, that it was there because it felt like I was actually hitting a ball. And so I began to wonder, well, how long would it take us to get to the point where we could build something like the matrix, something that's fully immersive. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I laid out the 10 stages to what I call the simulation point. And at the simulation point, you know, we are able to create fully hyper-realistic simulations that we cannot distinguish. Uh, and we are able to beam them directly into our brains. So we have brain computer interfaces and we're, we can have, you know, these AI characters that are simulated conscious characters within that. And so, I, you know, I estimate we're at about four, stage four or five out of 10, mm. right? Uh, and, you know, uh, 
right now, obviously the goggles are still pretty big for VR. They're getting smaller for AR. Um, you know, even if you go back to Ready Player One, which again was released in 2011, he had pretty slim goggles in mind. And at that point, there were no affordable commercially uh, available uh, VR headsets. And of course, within just a few years, you know, Oculus came out uh, with Oculus right. Rift. And now they're just getting, you know, the Quest 2. It, it's just starting to pick up in terms of number of headsets where even venture capitalists, you know, who, who go through these waves of investment. So there was a big wave of investment in VR around 2015, 2016. It was kind of the, the next hot thing in Silicon Valley and in gaming. But yeah. then after that, there was a bit of a dip because the headset adoption just wasn't there. Right. And so right. You know, people it's still not great. It. It's still, it's still, not, still great. not great. And people have described it as having a toaster. On, on your face, right? <laughs> right? The size of a toaster. Um, but you, we can see, you know, we can imagine pretty soon that we'll have glasses like this, this size that, that I'm wearing that, you know, we'll be able to do AR and VR together. And if you go back to Snow Crash, to the original imaginary, it wasn't a fully immersive goggles. Like there are times when he was walking around and he's connected into the metaverse, but he's also seeing things around him. Sure. So there's this kind of, it's kind of in between what we think of as full VR and AR, you know, the goggles that Stevenson was describing were somewhere in the middle. Uh, but but I think as we get to light field technology and being able to display projects out there, uh, objects, you know, we get to this idea of holographic projection using light fields where already we're seeing a blurring of distinction between a physical object and a digital object. And that's where 3D printing is, is also coming into to play. Of course, we can only 3D print within certain materials, but there are people printing blood vessels, right? Using 3D printing now where they're using, you know, pieces of human cells to do it. And so that's getting more and more sophisticated, but over time we start to see this breakdown of, well, what is an object and what is information? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's kind of what led me to believe that we would be able to get to the simulation point uh, which included, you know, these types of brain computer interfaces, both sending signals into the brain and reading signals out of the brain. And Neuralink and others right now are primarily focused on reading signals out of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out we, you know, we can read signals. You don't need a chip. Uh, there are, you know, headbands that can read EEG signals. Sure. There, there are, uh, you know, things like EMG, which is like uh, electrical signals that go through the muscles. Uh, there's people that are have things that are reading sweat. <laughs> you know, th right. there's all kinds of different ways you can read signals. Uh, but the problem is knowing what signal means what. And so that's become a bit of a machine learning problem is how do you know that you're, you, you're thinking about X versus Y. And if there's only like three or four options, it's actually not that hard because you just get enough people to give you data and you, you monitor their brain signals. Uh, but then sending information into the brain, that's where I think it gets a little scarier, right? Like you yeah. talked about earlier with hacking. And that's, you know, stage eight of, of my 10 stages to the simulation point. But once we get there, we'll be able to create these simulated worlds and we'll be able to create simulated beings within those worlds that aren't aware that they're just simulated. And this leads to an argument that, you know, Nick Bostrom, who's a professor at Oxford, had a few years back. He had a paper out called, Are You Living in a Computer Simulation? And his argument was that if any civilization ever gets there, that they'll create lots of simulations with billions and trillions of simulated beings. And there will be more of those more simulated worlds and universes and more simulated beings than there are biological beings because there's only one physical universe that we know of anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, if you are a being, are you more likely to be a biological one or are you more likely to be assimilated? And he concluded you're more likely to be a simulated being because there would be many more of those with the caveat that as long as one civilization ever got to that point. And, you know, our technology is moving pretty fast. And if you look at... Right where you know where oculus and, and the technology uh, the vr ar technology lives within facebook slash meta it's within a group called reality labs and they're also working on what else they're working on brain computer interfaces and so sure, turns sure. Out yeah, the yeah. Road map for the metaverse, yeah, yeah right through acquisitions and then they're, they're you know working on trying to improve the technology but the roadmap to for the metaverse looks a lot like my roadmap to the simulation point in my opinion. And so, you know, that makes me think that we may already be inside some type of virtual reality. Yeah. Um, so I, I think 
you know, to go back to Neil Stevenson for a second, that Neil Stevenson um, sort of gave us that warning because the metaverse in the book is controlled, like you said, by, you know, four or five corporations, right? Like one of them was Uncle Enzo and there's a few other ones. I forget them off, off the bat right now, but that essentially the thing, the battle cry that I really want people to understand around quote unquote web three, which is like the kind of cousin of the metaverse, which are both equally confused is that, you know, web three needs to really be, or metaverse, it needs to be about deep, demonopolizing the current internet system because i mean you were absolutely right like there's there's google there's facebook there's twitter there's amazon there's microsoft and you're pretty much that's it right like almost yeah. you know every single facet of your life it's almost like the four fundamental forces of the universe every single facet of your life can be created by a combination of those five gigantic companies um, and if there is indeed going to be this evolution to the next thing, whether it's metaverse or Web3 or whatever, that there has to be, I think, a little bit more um, thought about the concept of it not being designed in a way that it's very difficult for it to become monopolized. And I'm not a Bitcoin maxi, as they call them. Um, you know, because I'm I'm obviously huge into Ethereum and and, and a bunch of other types of tokens and I like you said Solana has some interesting thing and and you know Binance is doing some interesting things they're all doing some interesting things but it's kind of hard sometimes to look and argue that all these other tokens are not in some way centralized and for the benefit of a kind of um, uh, monolithic uh, group versus something like Bitcoin which, you know, the creator himself or herself is completely anonymous to this day. Nobody knows who he or she is. Um, or they. Never, <laughs> yeah. yeah there, there's a million Bitcoin sitting in five wallets that have never moved. Right. So it's not like, you know, this person is liquidating that Bitcoin and, and making money off of it. Right. And it's not like Bitcoin. Yeah, of course, there's gigantic stakeholders and, 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 and they can influence it. But it truly is, I think, at scale, the most decentralized system that we can look at for kind of inspiration. You know, do you think it's important that this metaverse is decentralized to the point of like the maximalist perspective? Or do you think it's inevitable that there will be the four or five major players that are pretty much controlling everything. Well, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that, you know, Meta or Facebook, uh, you know, would was really going to necessarily control the metaverse, uh, despite the name change <laughs> and and, right, and wanting right. to. And, and the reason despite is the that intentions, you know, the obvious intentions. <laughs> yeah, and the reason is that uh, you know innovation typically happens with new players coming into the ecosystem and there are, you know, just a slew of thousands of new companies, right. That have been created startups that have been funded by, by venture capitalists and uh, funded through token sales as well, uh, public and private sales. So, you know, there's just a lot of innovation going on. We don't know how that's going to shake out now. You know, I, I would be in favor of a more decentralized metaverse. I think it's inevitable over time that you will start to get consolidation it won't necessarily be the same four or five players we have today you know mm -hmm. just like 20 years ago it wasn't necessarily the same four or five players uh that, that that were the biggest companies in the world and so it seems like that changes more frequently now based upon how the technology has changed uh, how the technology changes but you know i do think that some standards approach is the right way to go uh, and then you may have enclaves uh, or metaverses that can connect to each other and that you can port things from, but that aren't so monolithic. Uh, so, you know, that would be my hope. Uh, but but I, I do fear that we're going to get, you know, some giant players. And, and you mentioned, you know, these big companies and you mentioned YouTube earlier. And while YouTube is an interesting model for anyone posting, you know, there are lots of people who have started complaining because they're getting, you know, their videos banned off of YouTube. And so, you know, there's a, there's, there's so much power that we're putting into 
these oligarchic companies. You know, we kind of live in an oligarchic system too. Oh, we talk about the Russian olig oligarchs all the time without talking about our oligarchs who also control our information flow. Um, and and so, you know, my, my fear is that there will be. Now the question is, will, you know, will it be one big giant company? I like as in the Oasis and Ready Player One, I don't necessarily think so. I, I think there will be, you know, several different players and it may even be that if we can get the interoperability right, you know, just like with the internet, at least we can, you know, have web pages and we can send emails that we will be able to have more interaction. And so I think that is the real promise of the right. metaverse. But if you look at the original term cyberspace, which came from, you know, another cyberpunk novel yeah. back in the 80s from uh, Neuromancer by William Gibson. And you know, yep. he says, well, what we call cyberspace today is not exactly what he was calling cyberspace at the time. Uh, but the term stuck and it became sort of a metaphor or an analog for things that happen completely online. Sure. Um, and, and I think that's where, you know, the metaverse is also perhaps going is it will be a metaphor or, or a way to describe things that completely happen in these online worlds, but it may not be a single metaverse in my opinion. Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, you said something there very, you know, very interesting to me because it's what I, would ideally want and you mentioned uh email and i think email is probably the only truly effective public protocol that's out there that nobody really owns and everybody leverages like yes you can have email servers but they're all kind of working off of the email protocol that's completely distributed and decentralized do you think that there needs to be some consensual agreement amongst these companies to create an open protocol for for metaverse but yeah but what the hell does that even mean right like 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 well you know. yeah you're right but i i do think that there is a, a reason to do that and you know if you look at uh, nvidia for example right who's trying to create the omniverse which you know they've has been called a metaverse for engineers but they're trying to simulate the real world and so as they looked around for standards you know they were looking at a standard called USD or Universal Scene Description, which was created by Pixar of all people, right? And so they were looking for. A, so Pixar created this this uh, protocol or, or this language description so that you know you could have a scene and, and you could film it in different ways, and so th it could be done dynamically as you decide. You know, within Pixar movies, you know you have sets, but they're virtual sets, and and you're like you want a, the camera to be here, and you want to be able to describe it, and so you know they're looking at adopting that, uh, and so standards like that, uh, like even with avatars, there are file formats right for 3D models, but. I was speaking with the CEO of a company called Ready Player Me. Like, I don't know if you know those guys, but they're like, they're an avatar company, and about they have about a thousand developers who use them as one of the avatar engines. So you create the avatar once, and you can use it in VR chat, for example, mm. or in a bunch of other Somnium space. And they've got a whole bunch of companies that are using. You just say, okay, connect in my Ready Player One avatar. And so I asked him, well, how easy is that for you? And, and he said, well, there, there, it's definitely not where everybody can just use the same format because everybody does things differently. Sure. So the developers have to integrate them in. But I, I do see the fact that they're getting enough traction in the marketplace as a good sign that shows that at least, you know, at least that what, what I would say maybe is maybe even the second tier of companies, not necessarily the giant companies, but the ones that are innovating below that are very open to this idea of a standards based, of a protocol based metaverse. And, you know, the web started off the same way as well, right? You have, you have right. web servers and you have web clients. Now, you know, as you started to get a monopolization of the clients with uh, Microsoft in the 90s, they started to define their own stuff, right? And then, you know, that was kind of broken by Apple and Firefox and Chrome and others as well. Uh, and, and so, you know, the web is still relatively, you know, decentralized in that way. It's just that companies or countries are putting up their own firewalls, you know, sure. for the web. Uh, but, but I do feel like, you know, the internet, I and mean, that's how the internet is architected, right? It's architected based on protocols in a distributed way. The whole DNS, uh, you know, which is domain name servers, which is like the core protocol where if I type in, you know, um, meta.com or cnn.com, it, it consults one of these DNS servers. 
Mm -hmm. um, and it finds out, you know, where they are. Well, that was meant to be decentralized because it was developed with the Department of Defense under, I think it was a DARPA as ARPANET. And they wanted to make sure that if there was a nuclear war <laughs> and some, some of the servers went down, uh, that you could still use the internet or the ARPANET at the time. Uh, and, and so, you know, the, the internet by its very nature is decentralized. It's just that as we've added these layers on top of it, we started using those decentralized protocols to direct all the traffic in yeah. specific locations, right? And so that's how it's gotten more centralized. But the underlying technology is still pretty decentralized today. Yeah, yeah. It, it's um, It actually reminds me of another Neil Stevenson book. And I, I forget if it's Cryptonomicon or the Diamond Age. I, I want to say it's Cryptonomicon. But he has this really interesting concept in there that um, the original vi that 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 God was very angry with humanity, so he introduced a language virus that he distributed in the Tower of Babel. That was and, actually in Snow Crash as well. <laughs> oh, was it? What, yeah. Okay. You know what? Maybe it was Snow Crash, that and not was Krypton in Snow Crash. Yeah. 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 And um, those three books kind of blend in together for me. They're both. All three of them are incredible. But it was definitely my younger, you know, self. But yes, this idea that language um, fractures, you know, and the communication becomes more and more and more fractured. And it's actually, you know, you can see it as a very true thing. The slang in Miami is very different than the slang in Atlanta, very different than the slang in Virginia, very different than the slang in New York. And they're yeah. all speaking English, but they all have their own flavor of the English and, and you the can language. see it, you know, even more in places like India or South Africa, mm. <laughs> where or New Zealand or Australia, where or the Europe. language is English. Yeah, yeah, in Europe as well. But but like the official language in these countries is English, but it's very different <laughs> from yeah. American English versus British English. So that's really. But then, but then there's this counter to the language, which is that um, that that power consolidates, and that you know that that it converges over time and um that it's impossible for there to be this kind of consensus beauty it's like almost bitcoin is like almost the only thing like in the world i had this other podcast where um the the guest you know challenged me with this idea of what's the difference between consensus and democracy and you know in a in, in consensus you need a hundred percent agreement you know, in a democracy, you just need a majority agreement, you know, so it's still it's OK, but it's still not, quote unquote, perfect. You know, we're, we're like with consensus, it is 100 percent agreement, right? Like all the nodes that support the Bitcoin network have to agree what Bitcoin is every single time a new block is created. And if there's a disagreement with that, right, there's, you know, what, what what's known as a fork. And there have been several forks over the, the history of a lot of these things. So a lot of people will say that that's the argument, you know, for decentralization. If you can fork it, it's decentralized, you know, because but but I don't know if that's necessarily true. You know, you know, anyway, it, it's a it's a fascinating piece because I'm trying to even in my own project, I'm trying to learn from the singular example that we can study that actually has been able to give us this taste of real decentralization and lack of sort of monolithic authority over something. Um, and my only kind of understanding of that currently is Bitcoin. I don't know if you have other examples that you can point to, but Bitcoin seems to be the only one that's working at scale that actually follows these rules at like at its core yeah i mean i don't know you know all the details of the consensus protocols because there's so many chains out there now <laughs> sure and each one has different uh you know but bitcoin at its core with its proof of work right uh you know is both a strength and according to some people a weakness because of the uh energy requirements <laughs> that are needed right uh, but as, as i understand that the bitcoin protocol you know if you have 51 percent of the uh, of the hash of the hashing rate, you could theoretically control where it goes. But what you can't do is go back. <laughs> and if you had to go back and say, okay, well, I wanted a, this other this other fork is the right one from way back when. Right. You, know, the, you would have to go back. You would have to keep the longest chain, which is the one that has been created because of the proof of work, is the one that's considered the consensus chain at that point. And so, as long as you have you know people solving the cryptographic 
uh, puzzle, which is what what the mining is. So yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is a very good example of that. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know Ethereum's underlying protocol, though it is also a proof of work. I think I know they're working on proof of stake. But it I was don't... proof of work, and it's been evolving over the last few years to a proof of stake model. I even think yeah. that uh, Vitalik's new book is actually called Proof of Stake, the Ethereum model or something like that. So yeah, I know that's what they're, they're trying to get to. <laughs> I don't know right. if they're, they're there yet. But I mean, there are, there are other, you know, consensus uh, protocols out there. Um, but that's a perfect example because, you know, the the Vitalik uh, story is a fascinating story. I've told it on this show before, but Vitalik um, invented Ethereum. Supposedly, this is the story because he was a huge World of Warcraft player. He played as a warlock. And one day they changed uh, the, the, the effectiveness of a spell called Siphon Life, uh, which is a very good spell. It basically just drained your opponent's life. And it was extremely overpowered. And often in these video games, there's constant balancing and nerfs, as they call them, right? And Siphon Life got nerfed. And one day Vitalik woke up and he saw that his Warlock wasn't as strong anymore. And he's like, who the hell made this decision? And that it upset him so much that he, you know, because he worked on Bitcoin Magazine, that he created his own chain called Ethereum or whatever. Um, but if you think about it, you know, um, Consensus Labs, which I think is their name, um, and Ethereum is pretty centralized, right? It's kind of like, you know, they're, they're the ones that control the core code. They're the ones that say, you know, we're going to, we're, we're going to fork. We're not going to fork. We're going to like, you know, like, you know, they had that big hack back in like 2015, I think it was back in the old days. Um, and, um, you know, they, they literally created a brand new chain of Ethereum, right. And left, the other Ethereum chain, which I think to this day is actually still running. Yeah, I think uh, isn't that the ETC, the Ethereum Classic? Isn't that the difference? Yeah, 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 yeah. E yeah. H, Ethereum is, is the chain that was kind of right. created and ETC is the old one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so anyway, yeah, you know, it's fascinating because it's like, I don't want this metaverse thing to be like, hey, my metaverse is better than yours. Come join mine, don't join theirs. Because then at that point, we're just making video games and we're just creating a, you know, like putting it under a genre and saying, hey, we all we all have games in this metaverse genre and mine's better than yours. I got more people playing mine than you do yours. You know, your best case scenario is that I'm going to buy you. And then it just becomes another classic like product, you know, capitalistic competition, which is fine. Um, but the promise of the metaverse, I think you and I are on the same page on, which is like. I have a metaverse. Um, these are my hooks. These are my SDKs. This is what my metaverse, how my metaverse works. If you choose to integrate your metaverse with my metaverse, this is the process of which to do that, right? This is the protocol that you can integrate yours to mine. Um, and that that like networking capability inspires other people to know like, Hey, if I'm going to build a quote unquote metaverse project, I know that I need to build it with hooks into these other projects. Just like if you're building a website and you're like, okay, what's your URL where well, your URL to your point is going to a TCP IP address and a DNS entry. And you have to like be aware of the protocol that you require to enter and become a quote unquote website, you know, that's kind of my hope for this metaverse thing, because as much as I respect Decentraland and Sandbox and, you know, Axie Infinity before they got hit for $642 million, <laughs> you know, the, the other yeah. week or whatever, um, the game is actually quite brilliant in its own uh, right. Um, right now, I'm working my ass off on building a metaverse. There's no chance that they're going to work with me. You know, there's no chance that I can call them and say, hey, here, here's my code. Here's my API. Do you want to trade code so that players from my world can enter your world? You know, and we could figure out like like what the technical you know limitations are, and maybe we even do like a different skew of the avatar if players want to travel between worlds. And no one's thinking that. Nobody wants that. You know, do you think that that's a requirement, or do you think that that's a little bit too idealistic? Well, I think that's where many of us would like to see. Uh, you know, the metaverse development go. And, and I think this brings up the importance of standards and classification and mm. protocols. And, you know, turns out, 
you know, we don't always pay a lot of attention to who creates these standards. You know, I, I, I met a woman who was uh, on, on the committee that uh, creates uh, emojis, right? I mean, who gets to decide? Right. And she asked this question <laughs> and, and she got involved because I think she was ethnically Asian and she wanted to create like a dumpling <laughs> based mm-hmm. uh, uh, emoji and and they looked and it was a small group of people uh, it, i think in sunnyvale or, or somewhere in, Ma- in in silicon valley you know from a couple of companies representatives from like adobe and a few other places and apple and they'd get together and there's like an executive committee of like these five white guys and they were just deciding everything for everybody right, right and and right. so you know for me this honed in this question and and i know you know a lot of times a company will just send people off to the standards committees when they don't have anything else to do. Like I remember once I had a enterprise software company in the XML content space before I was doing video games and mm. we sold it to another company, which became part of EMC. And you know, there was nothing for me to do there because I had been the CEO and, and, and I sold my company and they were like, okay, why don't you go sit on the standards board? And we looked at the Microsoft office standards formats and, and I got a kind of a glimpse into this world of standards because you had these committees. And so they tend to be like people who don't have anything else to do. They send them to these standards committees, but you really start to see that these standards are actually quite important. Uh, but I think with the metaverse, it, it may take because there's this you know economic component going on while it's being built. So it may take some amount of you know, kind of like a default standardization based on uh, what is successful. Mm-hmm. And so it's going to take somebody that is successful uh, that has a huge number of users to say, okay, we're going to open this up so that other people can integrate with us and we'll integrate with them, right? And so you need a, a, something of the size of Fortnite or a Roblox to say, we're opening up our standards, you know, and this is one of the reasons why I respected, you know, Second Life because they had published, you know, the the server protocols and they had open sourced the client at one point. So we're not going to work on it anymore. And, and, you know, within the crypto space, you know, many of these projects are open sourced, although you're right, there still tends to be this foundation or a group that is driving most of the direction at the moment. But I think many of them have the ideal uh, that they will eventually uh, become decentralized uh, or more decentralized to the point where that the original yeah. foundation or committee doesn't have to be involved. And part of it is there's just so many different tokens out there now and blockchains that you have to kind of look to see, you know, where there's a critical mass. So I think, you know, it will take some amount of uh, courage for one of the leaders whether it's, you know, maybe a combination of the development tools like Unreal and Unity, but you actually need, I think, an actual uh, world, virtual world or metaverse company that actually has a significant number of users to drive these type of protocols. And, and that's where it becomes a little bit tricky because the economic incentive isn't necessarily there. It is for them to say, hey, you can add plugins to my metaverse but not that I want to connect with your metaverse, right? There's right. the difference. And that's where I think, you know, companies like like Ready Player Me that I mentioned, and, and there are others trying to do, you know, similar things with avatars. I think, you know, standards for avatars, standards for scenes and locations, venues and geography within the metaverse, standards for objects, right? I think it would be useful for the NFT standards committees to then start working with some of these 3D models <laughs> committees, you know, which and formats, which are kind of two separate worlds today, right? Uh, and and figure out a way uh, to, and then that's where big big players do have some say in that, you know. Uh, like I do think, like Nvidia choosing USD as their scene description language might actually have some impact on other companies wanting to go that way also at some point. Yeah, yeah I um, I definitely agree with that because I. In my current project, I'm 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 basically taking all these NFTs, and then I have a team of people that takes the NFTs and interprets the data into three-dimensional objects, right? So in my game, you can do avatars, and we currently support apes, you know. And, yeah. and what we did is that you know we we modeled every single unique trait of the ape, and then um, our game reads the 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 trait description of the nft and then renders the ape accordingly um and the same thing for this other project i don't know if you're if you're aware of loot if you've ever heard of loot um loot it's like another nft project it's pretty big um 
but it's essentially only text and it describes like a sword with plus five strength or whatever. Right. So, right. Um, you know, taking these NFTs and actually being able to interpret them um, and give them utility. Um, but, you know, it's actually really interesting because in our NFT, we, we, we do provide you the OBJ file um, or it's either OBJ or FBX because I do believe OpenSea um, allows you to upload one or the other, right? I think it's FBX for, you know, for whatever reason, but um, yeah. yeah, no, it, it's, um, it's really interesting, man. You really got me thinking about some, uh, you know, some stuff here because I'm so excited about this space. I'm obsessed with the simulation. I've always told people it's kind of a dark thing to think about, but <laughs> on my deathbed, I want to look up there if I have the chance to actually have a deathbed, right? Most people don't get that that courtesy from, from fate. But, you know, when you're looking up that you're like, you know what, whatever the latest form of simulation that's possible on the planet, I've experienced it, right? Like I'm a true Plato's cave a lunatic I, I, I worked on the cave in Linz, Austria back in the day. I don't know if you're aware of, of what the cave is or was. Oh, um, yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the cave was like old school virtual reality yeah. where basically you wore these 3D glasses and there was this uh, um, sort of tracked projection um, in the room. Um, and, it you know, it was a complete like disaster in terms of like form factor. But, you know, for me, that's always been um, my obsession, you know, like currently – in terms yeah, of it was a like a holodeck, right? It was like an early prototype of a holodeck, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> still yeah, required yeah. some glasses, you're saying, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. you had to wear 3D glasses, similar to like those uh, flickering 3D glasses that okay. that that you would wear like in the Disney World or something. Yeah. Um, but um, the you know currently um, at a consumer level, there's a few very exciting simulation of uh, softwares that you know will blow your mind, like especially in the flight simulation space, um, which has always kind of been a very niche uh, space where, you know, ease of use and optimizing for the edge case is just not a factor. People do not like people that are into simulation software do not care if it's difficult, right? Like it's meant to be difficult, you know, like, yeah. like, like the high end simulation software, right? Like, yes. Uh, yes. Like I remember high when I was taking piloting lessons, you know, they would say, well, you can have this many hours in an actual plane, or you could have this many hours in one of their simulators, which right. cost like a hundred thousand dollars at the time. But they were pretty realistic. I guess they were realistic enough that they would actually give you those oh, flight sure. hours uh, and yeah. use them in, in your actual pilot training. Are you a pilot? Are you a, a, a uh, I never pilot? finished. I never finished the, uh, the the training, unfortunately. I got to like solo and then I got busy. And yeah, yeah. And yeah every yeah. few years I look at revisiting it, but uh, <laughs> just. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> so, so, so currently there's a game out there. If you're into VR, you should check this out unless you've already checked it out. You can play it via PC VR Oculus Airlink. But there's a yeah. game out there called DCS. I don't know if you're aware of this game, Digital Combat Simulator. Oh, and, I have. Uh, you know, I have heard of it, but I haven't played it. Yeah. Yeah. The the um, the that's the only flight simulator at a consumer level that has FAA approved flight models, mm -hmm. which are the same flight models that are used in the high end simulators. But the difference is that the high end simulators, the reason why you can get those accredited hours, is because they also are simulating uh, the the hardware. So you can actually like touch the joysticks and the buttons and the, right. and like, you know, the radio is a big part of it, the ATC or whatever. Uh, but this game is so incredible in VR because it takes you like three hours just to learn how to turn the plane on, you know? And like, and like, right. like sounds like me, a real plane. huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like for me, like imagine showing that to like a group of people at EA, like, it takes three hours to turn the plane on. No way. You know, like it, it's kind of, you know, it's just one button. Right. But um, anyway, yeah, it, it's, you know, like it's fun. And for me, I think the metaverse is about simulating the, the social experience, you know, like, 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 like DCS is about simulating the flight experience, um, which is its own beauty. But the, these metaverses is how do you create a social interaction that is so comparable to those that you have in real life, you know, that where like when you're moving your hands, you're emoting in a certain way. And of course, for me, because I love Star Wars and I love Snow Crash, 
you know, I also have lightsabers and, and guns and all that kind of stuff because like, you know, we have to be able to express ourselves somehow. And I think I've gone a little bit too far in expressing myself through combat, you know, like in my current iteration. But um, anyway, man, this we could go on for hours. This is fun. I, we, we're, we're already pushing an hour and 20 minutes. I want to be cognizant of your time. But you you mentioned these. Um, yeah, and I, I do need to go soon. So. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you mentioned these 10 points um, of getting to the simulation point. Is that in one of your books in particular? I'm very interested yeah. to read up more on that. Yeah, so uh, I have two books that are on this topic. So one is called The Simulation Hypothesis. Uh, and so that has a couple chapters dedicated to these stages. And then I have also a summary of them in my uh, latest book, which is called The Simulated Multiverse, mm. which takes the idea in a different direction uh, where you can have multiple timelines in, in a simulation and is based as much on the work uh, the, of uh, Philip K. Dick and, and the speech that he gave many years ago uh, about being in a simulation. So, yeah, it's in the, both of those books. All right, cool, man. I will check those out. Everybody else check those out. I'll put the links down below. I'll put the links in the Spotify description. Um, but Riz, man, what what a pleasure it was to chat with you, man. I've been looking forward to this. And and if you're up for it, I'd love to send you an invite so you can log into uh, my game uh, on Oculus and we can have a little bit of fun there. I can show you around uh, my weird little metaverse. You know, people say it's like going inside my brain so they get a little bit <laughs> creeped out. And it's like literally traveling, you know, like around my, my psychosis. Yeah. But I, I definitely would love to show you that in, um, you know, in the metaverse. Yeah, we'd love to see it. And, and you know, I think, uh, you know, where you're going with being able to take NFTs and bring them in to 3D models is is, is a really promising area. And, and I think one that, you know, will be crucial, maybe not just for the success of a single metaverse, but I think eventually that may be the thing that defines, you know, what the metaverse is as a, as a series of connected virtual worlds that are able to connect through these types of methods. Awesome. On that note, Riz, thank you so much for your time. I know we went a little bit over. I appreciate your patience and I look forward to chatting with you again soon, sir. Yep. Sounds great. Thanks for having me on.